So hello everyone, you are more than welcome to this Open Table Network Q&A webinar. Uh, my name's Kieran and I have the privilege of being coordinator of the Open Table Network, which is a growing partnership of Christian worship communities that welcome and affirm people who are lesbian, gay, bi, trans, queer or questioning, intersex and asexual, that's LGBTQA plus for short, plus our families, friends and all our allies. The network's been created by and for LGBTQIA plus people because churches don't always feel safe and welcoming for us. But our name, Open Table, is an open invitation to come in just as you are and be with us in a safe, affirming community. So following the success of our recent Q&As with our patrons, which are still available on our YouTube channel, we've begun inviting people with whom we work in partnership to have a dialogue around key issues that matter to us as LGBTQIA plus Christians and allies. And so because open to, uh, because October is Black History Month tonight, I'm handing over to Open Table Network trustee, Reverend Augustine Tanner Eim, to lead the Q&A. Augustine's an openly gay African-American activist, writer, speaker, who recently trained for Anglican ministry and is now a curate at St. James and Emmanuel Manchester, which hosts an annual Pride event, uh, which is a fascinating story in itself. Um, he's also a doctoral student in leadership, culture and practical theology, and he was the winner of the 2020 Church Times Theology Slam competition. So Augustine uh, will be talking with Reverend G.D. McCauley, who's the founder and CEO of House of Rainbow, which began 15 years ago to meet the needs of black African people who are LGBT plus and Christian. And G-Day's work of reconciling faith and sexuality has expanded to include counselling, pastoral support and human rights advocacy. G Day's an openly gay British Nigerian born in London. He's been a Christian minister since 1998, first with the Metropolitan Community Church and now as an Anglican priest in East London. He's an inspirational speaker, author, poet, pastor, preacher and HIV activist with a master's degree in theology. And in 2019, he presented the BBC documentary Too Gay for God, which examines church teaching on sexuality and marriage. And also in 2021, he was nominated in the British LGBT Awards for his outstanding contribution to LGBT life. So it's a delight to welcome such extraordinary people uh, to, to guide our conversation tonight. I'm going to disappear and I'm going to come back a bit later to share with you some questions from the audience. Um, so over to you. Jude, it's so good to be with you. It's so good to talk to you. Um, um, but before I ask you loads of questions tonight, I just want to pray, if that's all right. Absolutely, yes. Okay. So if you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on things of the earth, for you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ and God. When Christ, who is your life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Mm -hmm. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for um, Reverend Jude and everything he's about to bring us tonight, to hear his story, to hear what he's doing, to hear what God is doing amongst um, black and brown Christians around the world, and especially here in the UK. We bless your name, O oh Lord. Amen. 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 <laughs> I, I, I hope that people are you know, typing amen into the chat box and <laughs> let's let's leave this up to God this this evening. Amen. 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 So so Jude, um, I met you a couple of years ago. Um, but can you tell everyone else, tell us a little bit about your story, um, and tell us how you came how you came to faith um in a short amount of time. I know you're a black preacher, so I know you can go <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but... Okay, okay, okay. No, I mean I First of all, thank you so much for inviting me to this program and um, you know, also to Karen and, and Sarah as well. I wanna say thank you um, before we go ahead. Um, and for me, I came to faith um, you know, because I was born into a Christian family. So both my parents were, were ministers. And my mom is late, but my dad is still alive. So my parents were um, uh, Christians. They were also raised in Christian families themselves. Um, my father went on to become uh, a church planter. He's currently uh, the uh, principal, uh, founder and principal of a Bible university in Nigeria, which I believe is one of the second 
popular or well-known uh, theological institution in Nigeria. But my story of faith is also very important as an individual. Um, growing up in a Christian family, I, I came to faith and, and I obviously submit myself, uh, offered myself for baptism when I was about 13. And from that moment, I started to engage more with scriptures and, and, and the Bible as well. So uh, my faith has grown so much over the years. So, yeah. Hmm. So you, so, but then you later obviously became a minister, right? Uh, so you're, yeah. mm -hmm. you're called by God to, to be a minister within the Metropolitan Community Church. Um, and then you're now an Anglican priest. So what do you I think? I think, I think what, what we can say is that, you know, God calls us, but sometimes we have, uh, a different pathway and journey experiences that actually take us, you know, maybe somewhere. And I don't know what's coming next, but mm -hmm. I think that what I'll say is that um, I grew up in Nigeria. Um, yeah. I was born in London, but I grew up in Nigeria. And, and of course the uh, religious community that I was more aware of growing up, excuse me, was the African independent church uh, called the Celestial Church of Christ, which I believe was, uh, probably uh, out of the tradition of the Anglican Church, uh, just like the Cherubim and Seraphim Church, the Aladra Church, you know, those churches where uh, they have a connection with Anglicanism. So, but of course, you know, my journey towards um, ordination uh, started in 96. But prior to that, you know, I've been part of church growth, church leadership uh, as, a, as a young person, as a young leader uh, under my father. So in 96 to 98, I trained, you know, focusing on theology under my father's guidance and at my father's theological uh, institution. And of course, a lot of this training was, for me, was also on the backdrop of, uh, you know, uh, changes in my own life. Uh, in, in 94, in 1994, I came out as gay. Um, you know, prior to that, I was married to a woman and we have a family, we have a child together. Mm. But of course, you know, me stepping into theological studies on the backdrop as a divorcee and someone who's struggling with his sexuality, it meant that I had a lot of questions. So in 1998, I was initially ordained into ministry under my father's guidance and his, and his ministry. But I did not assume into that role because I still had many questions that were unanswered. So uh, in 2001, 2002, I was introduced to the Metropolitan Community Church. And um, of course, this was also after I have suffered many faiths. For example, the initial uh, church that I went to with my ex-wife and, and my family at the time, I was excommunicated from that church. I was also excommunicated from another church that I found um, you know, in between that time, between 1996 and 2000, I, I joined uh, a, a Pentecostal church in East London. Of course, when they found out that I was gay, I was kicked out again. So, of course, 2001, 2002, you know, I was introduced to the Metropolitan Community Church where, you know, I continued to worship there and learned a lot more about liberation, theology, inclusive theology. It was in this denomination that I made inquiries about transferring my um, legal, uh, my theological credentials uh, to the MCC church and that if I could be trained by the MCC church for ministry. So that took place. And of course, um, that took me many places, particularly to Nigeria, uh, where we started House of Rainbow. Um, and many people would know that the Metropolitan Community Church was not just a, a, a liberation ministry uh, in theology, but it's also a church that is a denomination as well known for its human rights advocacy. So uh, I think I caught the wind of the spirit in justice and ministry. So I had this great passion and, you know, to go back to Nigeria uh, to start a ministry that is inclusive and welcoming. But what people need to know is that, you know, uh, the year that House of Rainbow started, uh, it was also the year the Nigerian government introduced the anti-gay bill uh, okay. to its parliament, but um, people might say, oh, Julia, you're crazy, but I really don't know. I believe that the Holy Spirit had control 
God was in control, but I went out to for, Nigeria. Come on, yeah. Today, for for for, the, for those who are listening to the webinar right now, can you can you just briefly explain what that? Because I don't understand what it is, but can you explain what the anti-gay bill is? Yeah, um, thank you so much. I mean, the Nigerian government introduced the anti-gay bill. That's a uh, a bill that is seeking to punish uh, same-sex relationship, amorous relationship, or indeed any gay or lesbian seeking for marriage. And this is a bill that was introduced to the Nigerian parliament. Um, and of course, you know, that bill was supported and promoted by many uh, leading religious communities and networks within Nigeria. So many people might also be hearing about a bill that is introduced into the Ghanaian parliament. And of course, the idea behind these bills is that the anti-gay rhetoric is about quote unquote, you know, uh, protecting or preserving family values that will exclude and punish LGBT people. You know, uh, Ghana, like Nigeria, also proposed laws uh, to introduce conversion therapy by law. Uh, you know, these are, these are, you know, political and spiritual abuse against the LGBT community uh, in those spaces. So it was in, the, in that year, 2006, that we started House of Rainbow. Now, of course, you know, House of Rainbow, um, I continued to stay in Nigeria for uh, a few years until it became um, very dangerous. You know, I was, I was asked to leave the country for my own protection and for the protection of my congregation at the time. So I returned to England at the end of 2008. Now, of course, you know, the, the question of training uh, for priesthood in the Church of England actually had come up long before I even trained as a minister in the MCC church. So um, I was first introduced to the Anglican church in 1997. Uh, but at the time, I didn't, I didn't feel confident that the conversation around LGBT inclusion was actually strong enough. So I, I kind of stay clear of it. But I have amazing mentors and, and spiritual directors who are Anglican. So around about 2010, um, I was invited to a conversation uh, about training for ministry in the Church of England. And at this time, you know, I was able to measure how far the Church of England has come and how willing, you know, uh, some of the bishops are, you know, to understand my ministry. Because when I came to train for ministry in the Church of England, I was already well known for the ministry in Nigeria. So I didn't come undercover. I just want people to know that. So my ministry with the, with the Anglican Church was clearly directed and, and accepted. So I went through the whole process of designing. I went through all the conversations. Um, you know, I was recommended to the bishop's um, uh, panel. So, and, and I went for training uh, at Westcott House uh, in Cambridge, like everyone in, in that time as well. So uh, in 2013, I was ordained deacon uh, in, in a local parish in East London. So that, that's actually long-winded <laughs> way to respond to that question. So, so one, one thing I hear about, about your story is, about your passion for social justice, your passion for equality, your passion for um, people being able to flourish as themselves. Has that been uh, has that been something that was always kind of with you, even when you were a Pentecostal and you were married and everything? Or has that been something that has been birthed from having a more inclusive theology, looking at the Bible and looking at the gospel as a liberation um, source? I mean, I, I think it's always been there, but it, it felt locked down. It felt oh God, locked down. That's the phrase. Uh, it felt locked away. Um, but I think what is important to say is that I've always had a passion for people. Mm. Um, when I was very young, um, I I was practically, you know, providing pastoral care and support, you know, at church. You know, the church that my father was a leader. And, um, you know, I, I often look back and, and I always remember that, you know, in, in times of um, surgery, for example, um, there are times that I will have a longer queue for people that are waiting to see me as opposed to wanting to see my dad, 
you know, for, for pastoral care, prayers and support. So I've always known that calling is there, that passion has always been there. But of course, you know, as somebody who's raised African, uh, there is so much expectation as an African that people want you, uh, that, that you're expected to follow. Mm. And one of them is that of marriage, uh, heterosexual marriage to be precise. And because I was gay, I struggled a lot with that. But nonetheless, you know, I did, I recall that, you know, I struggled with it. I, you know, did so many things to pray away my sexuality. I prayed, I fasted. And when I met my ex-wife, you know, I truly and honestly believe that meeting her was a cure for my sexuality as a same gender loving individual. Um, I was so convinced. But the reality is that uh, every day that passes, there is always a struggle. Um, you know, it's almost as if this is my cross to bear. And, and I've shared this many times, you know, I mean, it, it, I often feel sad, you know, looking back now that there was a time where, you know, um, I might be holding my wife's hand, but my whole body experience and my emotional experience is completely distant from the person that I'm holding their hand. And it didn't seem fair. Now that I'm looking back, you know, at those scenarios. But having said that, you know, I've always had a passion, you know, for, for justice. And uh, Growing up, I didn't know how to go about it. But of course, you know, when I came out as gay, um, I was still very much lost. Uh, because when I found the gay community, the gay community was very white in yeah. London. And, um, and I'm so glad that today I'm speaking with you, uh, you know, uh, uh, Reverend, and um, you know, as a black person to a black person. But when I came out, there were no black, I didn't actually immediately find the black people in the gay community. I found the white people in the gay community and it actually confused me more. So mm -hmm. some of the services that I also found earlier on were not actually designed to address the issues of a black gay person in London. And when I also discovered the Metropolitan Community Church, the MCC Church in London was also so white. Yeah. So, but I was determined because I was so nourished in that ministry that, you know, the journey of reconciliation was going very well, that during my training, I was actually made, um, I was given a role for Minister of African Ministries. So um, that was part of my portfolio, you know, during my, my time at MCC Church in North London. So um, I've always had that passion. And I think that the MCC also helped me to connect with the, the issues around justice. Um, when I look back at my own relationship and, and when I separated and, and divorced my ex-wife, um, I never hold any grudge against her. Um, um, I was pretty, you know, depressed and, and, and there's a lot of anxiety, but I never took it out on her. Mm -hmm. And I've never had a, a word that is negative to say about her because I knew that, you know, if we were, if we knew better, if we had the appropriate pastoral care around sexuality, I would not have married her. I would not have believed that because I was in a relationship with her that I'm no longer gay. Um, one of the things I've always made very clear is that, you know, we can suppress and deny, you know, our sexual behavior, but we cannot deny nor suppress our sexual orientation because our sexual orientation is natural and is fixed. You understand me? Mm -hmm. So, and, and, and this is where we, you know, I'm always very mindful of, you know, how people understand human sexuality in the context of uh, uh, religion and, and church. You've, you've had quite a life. And I, and I, I, I think at Open Table, we really value when people just share their story because it's, it's, it's precious, it's sacred to us. But um, one thing I wanted to ask is, you know, you, you talked about, you know, growing up African, you know, and, um, and, uh, and I think that the African diaspora, whether you're in Washington, DC or you're in, Lagos, Nigeria, you do have some similarities, right? So, and you talked about like those queer spaces being majority white and it doesn't necessarily 
um, feel like that. I know I've even experienced this idea of what's harder being almost being um, um, with the intersection of blackness and everything else. What do you, what do you do? Um, so my question for you, so you do a lot of work with, you know, black queer people in the UK and around the world. So what do you think the, like where, two questions, like I would say, where's the future do you think with, with that, with black queer Christians or black queer Christians? And also, why do you think there's a divide between the black community and the LGBT community? Two communities are quite marginalized that often are at loggerheads with each other. Um, to be quite honest, I wouldn't actually say look ahead um, with each other. I think that what we need to know and well understand is that Black people around the world have very different histories. And we need to understand each other's histories and respect those histories. Um, I'm very much aware of African-American histories and I've learned a lot. You know, I've, got, I've had my fingers burnt for things that I've said about African-Americans that I think is wrong. And I think as well, you know, because Africans also have their own history. Now, I, I, one of my favorite countries in Africa is South Africa. South Africa was subjected to apartheid, you know, uh, regime until the early 1990s. Um, a lot of people my age in South Africa who are black grew up under apartheid. You know, I did not grow under apartheid in Nigeria. Nigeria was a free country, you know, as of the 1960, as of 1960. So our stories are different. So I cannot even marginalize the experience of a black South African or an African American and be able to draw a parallel as an African with Nigerian heritage or indeed in the UK. So we all have very different history and those histories needs to be respected you know, and also allow an African-American, a Black South African, or an African Nigerian, you know, to express their own understanding of their own history without creating um, resentment or, or argument over it. Um, so yes, I mean, I have had some really good conversations with my uh, African-American siblings, and, and I'm very mindful, you know, I've learned a lot and I, and I know where to draw the line. Um, and, and I know how best to respect uh, the histories and understanding. Uh, one conversation that came out recently um, was um, for me to understand the difference between civil rights movement for civil rights of uh, African Americans and also the rights of LGBT people. They are distinctively different. Yeah. Do you understand me? Yeah. So, and, and we need to have that understanding as well that, you know, uh, a Nigerian, you know, who came from Nigeria to live in New York is completely, has a completely different understanding of life as opposed to African-American who lives in New York. So uh, we, we need to try and find a way, you know, to, to also create a pathway, not just for peace, but also for better understanding of our histories. So what do you, what do you think the, the future is for? Um, you know, I th thank you so much um, for prompting that. I, I think that the future for, uh, for black queer people around the world, it's it, for me, let me put it into four contexts that, you know, I call it Judas four O's. Um, I mean, black queer people around the world need to be better organized. We need to be better organized. And even by organizing, um, you know, the, the betterment of our own future, we, we are going to need funding, we're going to need academics, we're going to need more research. Um, what's going on in Ghana, for example, is, is another good example. There were a lot of black people in Ghana that are providing academic response to the anti-gay bill. You mm. know, it's like, you know, I was listening to a conversation by a professor and, you know, in Ghana, who literally, you know, shredded this bill by saying that this bill is not worth the paper that is written on because it goes once against the constitution, it goes against human rights. We need academics like that. We need queer mm -hmm. people to stand up, to, to, to be organized. I think the second thing I'll say quickly is Occupy. And I, and I give glory to God in this moment because last year, September, when I was finally, 
finally, finally ordained to priesthood because there's a lot of story between when I became a deacon and when I, yeah. uh, I became a priest. When I finally became, uh, when I was finally ordained a priest in the Church of England, I was thankful to God and I said, now I'm occupying. So the second thing I'm saying to, to black queer people, we need to occupy. You know, I'm occupying a place in priesthood so mm -hmm. that I can be better positioned to provide pastoral care to the LGBT community that is appropriate to us. The kind of pastoral care that I did not get when I was seeking. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the kind of pastoral care that will ensure that, you know, societal addition, you know, is ruled out. You know, we, we have people that are living their life as God has intended it. Um, thirdly, is that we need to take ownership. We need to take ownership of our own care, of our own me mental health support. We need to take ownership. We need to take ownership from the church because there is so much abuse that has been pushed in our way. We need to take ownership. One thing I also want to say, sorry about Occupy, is that uh, I also look at it broadly. It's not just in the church. Um, where are the black queer CEOs? Mm. Where are the black queer millionaires and billionaires? Uh, because again, if we are able to occupy, we also have a say in what happens, you know. Where are the black queer people in leadership in the church? Where are the theologians and the academics? Okay, preach, um, preach. <laughs> <laughs> so thirdly is ownership. We need to take ownership as well because too much power has been placed in the hands of those who turn against us, you know. Mm. Um, you know, I found myself you know, uh, quoting scriptures about, uh, you know, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against, you know, authorities yeah. and, and spiritual wickedness in high places. And it's because power has been placed in the wrong hands, even within the church. And, and finally, we need to overtake. We need to overtake for the goodness of our communities and the, and the well of, of, of the LGBT people and indeed everyone else. One of the things I want to say very clearly is that, you know, my ministry is not an LGBT focused ministry alone. My ministry is for all people. And that was one of the reasons that, you know, training within the Anglican church was very attractive to me because I know that I can reach out to everybody. You know, families of LGBT people are also deserving of pastoral support, friends and allies. I mean, how about those religious leaders who also understand inclusivity? Just a few days ago, um, you know, I, I saw a tweet. Uh, 35 um, religious leaders in Uganda had signed up to a pledge for inclusion. That's now, that's, yeah, the that's, reality that's is that- That's a big that, deal, yeah, that's a big deal. It's a big deal and we need to celebrate that. But at the same time, I need to guarantee you in this conversation, that those 35 religious leaders are probably going through the toughest time of their ministry because they are aligned with justice. So there were questions, there are many questions. I mean, one, one uh, of them who I know very well, uh, Bishop um, uh, Christopher St. John, who a retired bishop, when yeah. he began to speak out, you know, in support of the LGBT community, they took away his pension. So, yeah. I mean, he's retired, but they found a way, you know, to, to vilify him and to humiliate him. But a question for you, I think, especially for someone who, you know, I'm into liberation theology, I love James Cone, um, African-American liberation theology, and even Catholic liberation theology. Um, and I, I understand having a post-colonial theology and what does that mean? So how, especially for those in, um, who are, you know, Methodists, who are, URC, who are Catholic, who are Anglican. Um, how do we then speak to our African brothers and sisters who have a more conservative view without um, feeling like we're pushing colonial views upon them? Um, if you, do you know what I mean by that? I do, I do. I mean, I, I think the first thing is to say that, um, you know, th theology is not necessarily um, a colonial view. I think we can do theology by understanding the context of that theology. Um, 
let's take let's go to Africa for a second. You know, when we talk about family values in Africa, and, and we want to talk about the theology of family values, what we are seeing today that is so homophobic does will not fit in into that theology of inclusion. Um, African and African theology has been expressively inclusive. I think what we're seeing is the abuse of the conservative um, well, family congress that we're seeing from America. And unfortunately, yeah. it seems to be coming from America. Yes. And, and because it is highly funded as well, there is a lot of money behind this abuse. There is a lot of money to promote conversion therapy. I mean, when my own father, you know, will conclude that it will be okay if I go to jail under Nigeria's anti-gay law for 14 years and also be subjected to um, hard labor and conversion therapy, shock therapy to be precise. This, this was recommendations by my own father. So you know that, you know, th this is evil in itself. Mm. I mean, African culture is, is, is very, very much inclusive. So, and I think that for me, um, we need to have dialogue. We need to have a lot of dialogue. In 2009, I was part of a dialogue that took place in Stellenbosch in, 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 in South Africa, uh, Stellenbosch University. The dialogue was between the LGBT communities and activists and religious leaders across Africa. So it is important that we have more dialogue. So the opportunity to have these conversations, particularly with um, black uh, theologians within these various denominations, it calls for an ecumenical dialogue on this issue itself. And um, I was one of the, the, the co-founders of the Global Interfaith Network, um, which has a secretariat in Johannesburg. And the idea behind it is to actually empower, you know, um, Africans and, and, and people around the world, in, in, especially in the global south, around the theology of inclusion. And I have contributed chapters, excuse me, I've contributed chapters to uh, theological books uh, about some of the approaches that is necessary. And one of them is about learning. Um, mm. those, many, many LGBT theologians in Africa are also not learning about inclusion. So I want to be able to pass on my own knowledge, my own experience as well. Um, we started to work with academics, you know, uh, universities in South Africa, uh, the National University of Lesotho, and also University of Botswana, you know, where we are looking at how do we develop uh, theology that is inclusive and progressive, you know, within the global South, and particularly in Africa. And also finally, um, you know, I put a call out quite recently um, that we need a coalition of um, African LGBT clergy, you know, for a number of reasons, but two reasons I think it's very important. One is actually about the theological understanding of the LGBT community, because for many themselves, they're still struggling. The second reason is because many who have been ostracized by their own denominations are experiencing hardship. And how can we address that? You, know, you can't have a clergy who is gay or lesbian or who is inclusive going through um, you know, poverty and, and hardship. It, it's totally unacceptable. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. And I, 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 I could listen to you all day because I love your passion. Uh, what do you think the largest challenges in the church of being more diverse and inclusive? part one, and part two is how can we support and champion black and brown um, siblings and our open table network communities? Thank you. I mean, let me take the second question first. I think that the support and, and championing for black and brown people within the open table communities is very, very crucial. Um, I think that you know, open table needs to look at its own base, needs to look at its own communities and Again, just like we do in the LGBT uh, community, we, we ask ourselves this question, 
who is missing at the table. I like it that it's open table. So it's an open table. Yeah, yeah. But of course, you ask yourself the question, who is who is absent? Who is missing at this table? Uh, we don't necessarily wait for them to come. We need to go to them in order to ensure that we are able, because sometimes people don't know that they could be part of it. Just like my own experience with the Metropolitan Community Church, you know, when I got there, I was maybe one of few black people and it was very uncomfortable for a while, but I'm very glad that now, you know, there is a lot more inclusion and diversity in, in, in the MCC church in London, All right? So, and, and also uh, Open Table can also look at its own uh, leadership as well. So it's not just, you know, in, in the pews or in the congregation, look at your leadership as well and try to do some work around that as well. And, you know, before you know it, um, it will it will include people, um, and and of course you know not don't do tokenism. Uh, we're gonna have a black person, but if they're not going to contribute, if they're not going to uh, bring something to the table, then it's absolutely not worth it. To be quite honest, so I say you know grow the group organically and and let it flow. Mm. Um, on the question of the largest challenges in the church, um, there were two documentaries that. Um, was featured uh, in the last few years. And if I won was last year, and um, was it last year or early this year? Anyway, um, on, on the BBC, um, the, the, the title of one of the documentary is, Is the Church Racist? And, and I also did a documentary in 2019, um, Am I Too Gay for God? Um, Very good. These are two, good. yeah. These are two important documentaries that are asking questions. So, um, I believe that the church has always been challenged. You know, um, if we go back into history, it was the issue around slavery. Um, the church was complicit. It also came with the issue of discrimination against women in ordination and bishop and so on. So there are challenges. So we're seeing challenges around racism. We're seeing challenges around transphobia and homophobia in the church. I believe the church needs to wake up as well. I mean, this is not just uh, a theological disaster, you know, I think that the church needs to wake up to its own reality. Um, you know, Proverbs 4 verse 5 says that, you know, um, what does it say again? It says that, uh, that I, I've got to get this right, 4 or 5, it, it says something around learning, you know, we need to do a research. God is calling us to learn, to learn more. Um, I'll probably remember the scriptures when I talk to scriptures again. <laughs> I know, can you imagine? I, it just, just went off my head. Um, you know, but we are called to research. So it's Proverbs 4, 5. You can use Bible there. Um, it's a very short verse. Get, get wisdom. That's get it. Get wisdom. Thank you. Do not get forget wisdom, my words. Get understanding. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we, the church needs to get wisdom around some of these issues and some of these challenges that we're facing. Um, and, and of course, you know, it is so important that the, the church is also open to dialogues, open to conversations and open to research. And the other thing I also say is that, you know, Jesus said to his disciples, he said, I'm going away and I will send the Holy Spirit, the, the advocate that will teach you new things. Hmm. The church should not pretend that they know it all. You know, you know what we know today can be obsolete tomorrow when we wake up. We are called to renew our challenges. We are called to that wisdom, get wisdom, get understanding. We are called to a renewal of mm. our minds. So I'm sure that people are on this call this evening are not surprised that even Saul, who was persecuting Christians, changed his mind because the Holy Spirit came upon him. Peter, who did not believe that the Gentiles should be, become Christians, changed his mind because the Holy Spirit came upon him. Um, I'm praying for the church that the Holy Spirit will come mm -hmm. truly on the people that are in opposition and truly just have this greater understanding of God's own children. Um, so Amen. Um, Amen. The, the church may have a challenge, but I just know that God is at the center of this storm for the church, and we can find a way uh, to move that forward. And now we want to take it, take it, thank you. We want to take it to 
to Kieran to ask some of the audience questions. And thank you, G Day Augustine. I get the sense that this conversation could go on for many hours, and and uh, it's it's fascinating and energizing to hear your passion. Um, so we've had a question about um, you know your your kind of early story, uh, the early part of the uh, conversation this evening. How do you find it in yourself to forgive and maintain a relationship with people close to you, like in your family, when you've experienced their homophobia? Mm. Uh, thank you for the question. <laughs> um, you know, forgiveness is really about me, uh, not about the other person. Because um, if I hold grudge and I'm completely resentful, I don't know. They might have just carried on with their own life, but I'm, I'm carrying on with this pain. But what I do is that I take it to the Lord in prayers. One of the things I'm very honest about is that I don't have to have a relationship with you, but I will forgive you. And a good example is my father. Um, I forgive my father, but I chose not to have a relationship with my father because his relationship with me is very toxic. Um, the way that he has handled himself on the matters of sexuality and you know supporting the Nigerian government in promoting the law and celebrating um, in 2014 uh, the passing of the bill into law um, was completely disrespectful even though he was very aware of my sexuality. I'm not asking him not to take his own position as a conservative um, Christian but I would have thought that he would have also you know, be mindful that his son is also gay. Mm -hmm. But I think that my father, in my opinion, kind of threw me to the wolves. But what I do know is that I am a child of God. And that is why I always make sure that I'm reminded every day that being gay for me means God adores you, mm -hmm. God accepts you, God admires amen. you, and God anoints you. Amen, amen. So, um, so forgiveness is very, very big. Um, let me just throw one quote in there. I'll remember it this time, Augusta. Uh, it's it's first, first Peter uh, chapter... <laughs> first Peter chapter 3, verse 9. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> first Peter chapter 3, verse 9 says, you know, do not repay evil for evil or abuse for abuse, but on the contrary, repay with a blessing, for this is why you are called, that you might inherit a blessing. You know, let me just say that as, as, as a black child that grew up in church, I think I know scriptures a little bit. <laughs> so that's my response to that question. I hope it helps. Yeah, that's that's really on, honest and authentic and inspirational. I'm sure that other it will speak to others in their struggles with close people close to them who've maybe rejected or judged them. Yeah. Um, Andrew. Um, shares that he spent some time as a gay priest in Ghana and with many other gay priests from the UK. Um, he said, it's very disturbing to hear of the Anglican Church of Ghana supporting their government in anti-gay propositions. So Andrew wonders, how would you suggest that we move forward in our relationship with the Ghanaian church? I mean, like I said earlier on, I think this is the time for dialogue, to be quite honest. I mean, a lot of people that are supporting this homophobia in the church are probably not homophobic themselves. Um, and the reality is that when you have a denomination that has a position, it's very difficult even for some of the clergy to actually take a public position that is in opposition with the with their denomination. What I have learned and what I have seen, um, you know, is that many clergy are inclusive in their own churches. Uh, regardless of what the denomination says, but that's not enough. Um, I think, first of all, um, what I believe we should do, let's start with a dialogue. Um, let's start with a lot of training programs, you know, from us to them and vice versa. Um, last year during the lockdown, I was doing training uh, with a clergy in Kenya uh, using Zoom, the same platform, and also in Liberia. Before the lockdown, uh, a, a huge part of my work was in Southern Africa, going from one country to another, you know, meeting with clergy and really taking them on that journey of theological inclusion for the LGBT community, working with families and parents of LGBT people. I mean, what, do you, what does a clergy say 
to a parent whose transgender child has been murdered or mm. whose lesbian daughter has been raped? Mm. What do they say to them? So we need to be able to have this conversation to be able to readdress the abusive theology that mm. is also centered around conversion therapy. There's nothing to come. There's nothing to change. Thank you very much, Gide. It's uh, really timely that we remember our siblings uh, in Ghana and around the world. So David asks, are you hopeful that the situation for LGBT people, both in church and society in different countries in Africa, will improve? I strongly believe that it will improve and it can only improve when the, we, the LGBT people, step forward as well. Um, we occupy places. To be quite honest, I mean, listen, I mean, my, my picture of occupying is that if there are more lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, uh, non-binary, non-conforming people in the <coughs> theological positions, the church will wake up because we will be able to provide a proper theological response. We can also be the theologians. Uh, the, 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 the theologians, the academics as well. There are so many people outside of the LGBT uh, family is, uh, that are doing a lot of work um, around inclusion and theology. So, and there are also people who are not even people of faith who are writing books about theology and Africa and, and many other things. And I'm like, you know, hold on, where is your faith in this one? But what is crucial is that we need to occupy, to be quite honest, and, I, and I'm not talking about a military takeover here. I'm talking about the visibility within those spaces. And um, we can do a lot more. And one of the things I've said, and I'm sure that you probably recommend this at Open Table, that a church that seeks to be inclusive should put out a rainbow flag inside the church premises. Yeah. You know what I mean? You can go one step further and put it on the notice board outside. And, and a quick example, I mean, someone tweeted again, because I love my tweets. Someone tweeted recently a story that was so beautiful. There's a church in Leeds. Uh, is it, is it, the church is an Anglican church, very inclusive church. Now, somebody has been following the church on Zoom during the lockdown. Now, now that they've come out of lockdown, they traveled from their home to that church. And the reason they did was because they saw a rainbow flag during the, the screening of, of the service. So, and the story then broke out because they were taking photographs with the rainbow flag to say, I'm in a church where nobody's judging me, I can be myself. And that Amen. is really good for the ministry, yeah. you know, yeah. that we're doing. Absolutely, we do definitely encourage our communities to be as visible as they are able to be. Um, it's like a beacon of hope to people who've been uh, excluded in so many ways. Um, so the last question from the audience um, is that, would you say that the Black Pentecostal movement has generally been a hard place for LGBT people, perhaps more so than other churches? Um, <laughs> yes, it has been, to be quite honest. And I think that... Um, you know, I think that the walls that they're building for themselves is actually crumbling. And because a lot of their practices are, is being exposed, um, a lot of the biblical interpretation that they're standing on is actually also being dismantled, to be quite honest. Um, there is a documentary film that is about to be released um, called uh, With Wonders. Um, With Wonders, two words. And, and this documentary film is about, I think, five or six uh, Christian who identify as LGBT, you know, share their stories. And I, I happen to be one of the people that has contributed to this documentary. And, um, and, and I think that the, the documentary is so powerful that it, it gave an example of LGBT Christians who are not giving up on the church or on God but using our own story, our own visibility, the challenges that we have faced, you know, as a way forward, you know, so that other people can see and know that God is still with the LGBT people. So the other thing I also say is that people can look this up on YouTube. Uh, it's not a hoax. Um, 
There is also a documentary that is being de developed called the 1946 movie. The 1946 movie is centered on the mistranslation of First Corinthians chapter six, verse nine to eleven, where the inclusion of homosexuality was was included in the Bible in 1946. It was now discovered that it was a mistranslation that was actually notified to the uh, translation committee at the time, but they failed, you know, to stop it going into print. So for the past 75 years or so, you know, um, the black church particularly have relied on this mistranslation, you know, uh, blunt, blunt, blandfully to condemn and vilify the LGBT community. So like I said, let's go back to the dialogue, let's have this conversation and let's tell the black church that look, you're treading, you know, on the wrong side of justice. Yeah. And let's try to help them get on the right side of justice. So yeah, so obviously our name is Open Table and we believe we're extending Jesus' uh, invitation to for everyone to come without condition. Um, so that's our, our, our inspiration and our prayer. Um, but if you could sit around a table with anyone, G-Day, uh, who would it be and why? Oh, goodness me. <laughs> I would like to sit around the table with Lil Nas X. <laughs> ah. <laughs> I, just, I just love his, I just love his artistic um, uh, video, uh, um, Call Me By Your Name. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. where he, he had a story, this beautiful story um, about going to heaven and then descending to hell. And, and we, we did a, we did a blog open table did a blog about that. yeah well you, think, you know I mean, yeah. what really what really got me is that people were not talking about the first part of that video about the story of why he was struggling about the injustice they were not talking about why he was ascending to heaven and why he changed his mind and said i'm going to hell because you told me i'm going to hell they mm. focus a lot more on the fact that he was pole dancing into hell and lap dancing with the devil but I did not see it that way. I would really like to sit with him at open table. I've got a few people that I scribbled very quickly. And let me just go through that. Just allow me one minute for sure. all the rest. This one, Tutu is definitely one of the people I like to sit with. I just love his message, particularly when he, he had this amazing sermon where it's uh, all and all, you know, shall be lifted up, you know, and I love that message on inclusion. Um, the other one is Bishop Yvette Flander. Um, the founder of the Fellowship of a Family Ministries. Uh, she's African-American. I love her so much. Uh, she's my spiritual mother. And Reverend Troy D. Perry, the founder of MCC, uh, amazing human being. Uh, his story is, my story is kind of similar to his story. Uh, he was married and he was divorced and he felt like he's going to die. And then he started his ministry. And of course, uh, you know, right here in England uh, is the amazing Jara Robinson Brown. Mm -hmm. uh, the reverend himself i would love to be around the table with him at open table thank you so much gide what an evening that would be hey uh and yeah we hope to uh to have one of these conversations with jarell before too long that would be a, a gift to us all i think Amen. um just as this this evening has been um augustine did you, anything that you wanted to to add before we close yeah, I just think that, you know, thank you so much for all that you do, Jude. I think, um, you know, being a, you know, being a young black man who is queer and also in ministry, um, what you do, um, you don't necessarily always know the impact you have for so many people. And you have impacted my life over the last, how long have I met you? Four, four years. And I, I really, I really appreciate it. And I think that God is using you in such a powerful way to be able to help and transform people's lives and keep people alive that are who are um who are black and just people and their extended family as well so i just want to thank you oh, augustine g day it's been a delight such inspirational passionate people uh so good to be around um so uh it's uh, a gift to us all that you could be with us for this time tonight and so thank you both and thank you all for joining us for your questions if you've been touched or affected by anything that you've heard here tonight, please do reach out and ask for support. Um, 
we're here for you. And if we don't know the answer, maybe we know someone who does. But also do reach out to House of Rainbow or if you know of someone who would benefit from the Ministry of House of Rainbow, they're a great partner that we are really keen uh, to support and to encourage people to seek out. So this has been the 12th of our Q&A webinar series. Um, so we've completed a full year, starting with Rachel Mann, one of our patrons last November, through to this evening Black History Month special. Um, but we're going to take a break from webinars for a few months and relaunch in February 2022 with a new series of conversations with our friends and partners around key issues that matter to us as LGBTQA plus Christians and allies. So next month, we're going to share an online visual for Trans Day of Remembrance, uh, which is an annual observance on the 20th of November in memory of the trans people who lost their lives through an acts of anti-trans violence in the past year. So that's going to be a YouTube premiere. So please do subscribe to our YouTube channel and don't forget to click the bell icon if you want notifications of our new videos. And if you're not on our e-news mailing list, why not sign up for the latest updates on our website? We send an e-news about once or twice a so month. We've also experienced a huge amount of growth in, in the past year. We're blessed to have five new open table communities beginning in, in the last 12 months. Um, but we're growing faster than our, our resources. So we do ask you if you value the work of open table locally and nationally to pray for us to consider sharing your gifts by volunteering if you are able. We are a community of communities and we are richer for all of you being in it. Um, but if you are in a position to contribute in financially in any way, um, we would be most grateful. It will help us to reach more isolated LGBTQIA plus people in many more communities. Um, but, but above all, please do pray for all that we do and all that we are. We are greater because of you and and the spirit is moving among us and we thank god for that thank you again to g day to augustine and all of you for joining us tonight and we look forward to hosting and welcoming you in jesus name soon good night Amen. god bless and go well thank you